Um, I just wanted to like start this off with a little like personal story. Like lobbying in Chicago is something that I admittedly know very little about. Yet this is the very first civic app that I ever worked on. It's called ChicagoLobbyist.org. Uh, it was really like kind of the start to like my journey in doing this stuff. Uh, and it was all because this open data was available. And one of the things that I learned from building this website is that like, you can make something and you can put a bunch of stuff on a web page, but in this case, it only like, led to more questions. Like, what, like, so Theodore Brunsvold, he's a lobbyist, right? Looks like he's making a lot of money. He does stuff like procure business. Like, like what does that even mean, right? So there's just so much to know, and I feel like so much of it cannot be, or at least has not yet been, captured by anything data that's like open data, right? You just need people to tell you what's going on. And so we have a very cool person here, uh, Adrian, to uh, give us a little bit of insight into what she does uh, and sort of uh, lift the veil a little bit in terms of what goes on uh, when it comes to policy uh, at city council. So without further ado, Adrian Alexander. Thank you. So. So if you had have gone to me on the website, you would have seen that I do one thing, and that's lobby city council for one client, and that's AFSCME, Council 31. So we are one of the biggest labor unions in the state. Um, most people know us right now because of uh, us being the largest state employee union and the budget impasse and the contract we don't have with the governor yet. Um, but I do, I do city council lobbying, I lobby Cook County, I also uh, lobby at the state level, but for tonight's purposes I'm going to focus on city council. Um, the easiest way to explain what I do is I look at budgets, I look at legislation that comes out, I look at what the impact on our members is going to be, uh, I talk to aldermen or state reps, whoever, about the impact on our members and then when they're great with us i hope that they and help that they get reelected. and when they're not sometimes we support candidates against them and i help coordinate our members um, against them so it's kind of a really three-pronged strategy on what i do um, and i say that because not all lobbyists do all those things and because i think it's particularly important for the work that I do, that I have my hands in all of those pots. Um, so when people ask me about being a lobbyist, because often they're surprised when I tell them that's what I do, the question that I get asked the most is, well, what's your biggest win? Or what's the most important piece of legislation that you've passed? And until this year, I didn't really have an answer because we play a lot of defense that asks me. Um, and But this year we had a big win at the city council. Um, we, after three years, passed an ordinance dealing with privatization. Um, and it started out as the Privatization Transparency and Accountability Ordinance. Um, during the 2011 budget, uh, the mayor moved to privatize um, a water billing department. And uh, we represented those people as about 40 folks um, and it was built into the budget. So it, it got a lot of um, aldermen kind of upset. Uh, it was supposed to save $100,000. There was 40 people who live in the city that were getting laid off, mostly um, black Southsiders. So the aldermen in their wards, you know, our members were calling their aldermen to talk about it. Um, and Alderman Sawyer introduced the uh, PTAO ordinance um, to, to try and do something about creating a process. So if the mayor wanted to privatize something, there would be a council, city council would be involved. Um, for assets like the parking meter deal that most everyone is familiar with, there is a process in place that was set up by the state actually. Um, that required city council passage, which is why, you know, there was the big uproar that only a few uh, aldermen voted against it. That was not the case for services. And we had a number of uh, services privatized where we represented members. So uh, we worked with Alderman Sawyer to get this legislation introduced. When it was introduced, we had 27 co-sponsors on it. Um, 
and it was happened right with, in, with the budget process. So I called my mom afterwards. I was so excited. This was, I was like a year into the job. City council was still new and fun to me. <laughs> um, and so I called my mom, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. We got the majority of council to sign on to this privatization ordinance. This is great. This is like, you know, for me getting above 25 was like the thing you need to, to hit, the number you need to hit to make things happen. Uh, majority of council supports it. So of course it's going to pass. So um, it took three years to get there. <laughs> um, and important is what happened in the middle. So after we got that, the 27 signed on, it got kicked to rules um, and sat for a while. We did a lot of press um, work. We had a broad coalition, not just of other unions, but of community organizations. Um, we just uh, like an, a really broad coalition. I think we had 36 organizations that we worked with. Namely, um, the Better Government Association got on board with it. Um, and we actually had the uh, Union League Club support, which, you know, when you're talking, we were working also with a, a DC organization that does work on privatization nationally. And they were like, oh, great, you got the Union League Club, you know, another union organization. I'm like, no, <laughs> like, this is a big get for us. Um, they even hosted, they hosted, um, a press conference, um, it was a big deal that they were taking a position on a policy uh, policy initiative at the city. And we had a pretty diverse group of aldermen uh, on our side too. So um, so we had some good spokespeople for the issue. It's, it's really a quite boring process. It's completely process oriented uh, legislation. Um, that just sets up review after a year, um, after, after the privatization has gone through, you have to meet a certain threshold, things like that that are really important to us. Um, and generally have, uh, you know, people care about privatization in Chicago mostly because of the parking meter deal. Um, so in that, in that sense, it was important to people, but it didn't have quite uh, the touchy-feely, um, very concrete outcomes like a housing ordinance would. Um, so we had to do a lot of press. We, we actually had a guerrilla sticker campaign on the parking meters to talk about the ordinance. Um, it was hard to get press to stay focused on it because you know nothing was happening. It was stuck in rules for years. And um, so they were like, well, if nothing's happening, there's nothing to talk about. And we're not really going to write stories about nothing happening forever. So um, we were kind of in limbo for a while, but we were constantly trying to organize our members and organize different constituencies around it, put pressure on aldermen to go talk to the mayor, to go talk to the chairman of rules um, to get some movement on it. Uh, so it, it took a lot of both like lobbying on my part, but that wouldn't have done it alone. It took the press, it took the grassroots work. Um, and finally we got to a point it also took an election, um, I think is fair to say. Um, we finally got to the point where the administration was willing to sit down with us. We negotiated um, a, a deal and in November, we, in November we passed uh, the legislation overwhelmingly. So that was like my first <laughs> win um, at city council. And um, it, it just kind of gives you a sense of it, on a policy level at City Hall, it can take um, a long time if you're, if you're not, initially it's not something that's supported by the administration. Someone asked me on Twitter like, about the changing uh, dynamic between city council, between the council and the administration. And I think it's important to realize a lot of city councilmen, uh, a lot of aldermen are most of the calls that they get are not about policy, right? Like the overwhelming majority of the calls that aldermen get are about tree trimmings, alleys, trash, uh, you know, these very quality of life, very specific to their ward issues. Um, those are the things that drive most voters. I mean, even me in my personal life, I've only called my alderman once and it was about graffiti. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, there really isn't a 
personal when you're a lobbyist and calling aldermen. So I said, you know, hey, there's this graffiti has been up forever. It's huge. It's uh, uh, really an eyesore and a problem because it's gang graffiti. And I know you guys cut the graffiti busters, blasters <laughs> in the 2011 budget and haven't really recovered. But, you know, I think this should happen. <laughs> um, so so uh, the things that drive the voters are really kind of critical to what drives the aldermen. Uh, and they're not being talked to by a lot of people about policy issues. So I think that creates both an opportunity in that if there's something that you see and you want done, I, I think you'll stick out because you're not, there's not a lot of folks talking to aldermen about that. Um, and you, the aldermen may be willing to work with you in a way that um, might surprise you because there's just not that many people talking about that. Um, but you should also know that when you're talking to aldermen because most of them, I think it's fair to say, most of them, their mindset isn't, that's not the primary focus of their job. There's a lot of people on the, on the election side. You can be the most citywide focused alderman, really focused on policy, but if you don't take care of the stuff in your ward, you will lose your election. And um, I mean, the first round of aldermanic races when I came, uh, we supported uh, Frederina Lyle in the sixth ward, and she had like a 95% voting record with us. And I remember we were ca calling our members to let them know like, hey, the union has endorsed in your ward. And people were saying, that's great, but I live on her alley and she doesn't even keep that clean. Or that's fine, but when I go up to the office for ward night, her staff has an attitude. And we were really hard, but it didn't matter because of that very basic stuff. And our, I think that our members are pretty engaged, right? Um, and usually when we tell them the unions endorse someone, this person has been, is in a fight for uh, their seat and they have a really good record with the union, that usually means something. But Alderman Sawyer was able to beat her in a runoff I, just for that, that very basic reason. Um, so I, I say that to say, those are the things that are driving a lot of the aldermen and the stuff that's going on in the media. Um, I, think, I think it's kind of started, I'd say the, 2005, the 2015 um, aldermanic races where so many more went into runoff than previously ever had happened, I think made a lot of aldermen pay attention uh, more, realize that they had to be more responsive. Maybe it wasn't enough to say, I have the support of the mayor. They also have to have something on their own to, to stand for. Ooh, dramatic lighting. <laughs> uh, uh, it's because I mentioned the mayor. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that that kind of made people pay attention. And like it was interesting because Alderman Sawyer, um, there's being in the Progressive Caucus um, and, and in the Black Caucus, I think before the elections, there were a number of aldermen that were looking at them like, you know, you should be careful stepping out too far. Um, and then there was kind of a wave of more progressive aldermen that got elected and uh, none of the Progressive Caucus folks that were running for aldermen lost. So I think him getting elected, um, Black Caucus chair kind of shows how, how folks' mindsets were changing a little bit. And then when you add on that, on top of that, the pressures from the Laquan McDonald video and the aldermanic vote and lack of questioning on the settlement and the pressure that they've gotten there, I think it's making them more aware and more concerned and realizing that they have to do more or at least be seen as doing more. But I don't think I'm not bought into the idea yet that there's going to be some kind of revolution in council um, to where um, there, there's going to be a huge change or a huge um, backlash for the mayor. Uh, I, just, I just haven't seen it yet. Um, what I did see last council meeting was a flurry of introductions, uh, particularly around criminal justice. And I think, you know, people want to be seen as doing something. It'll be interesting to see a, a number of those 
were sent to rules. It'll be interesting to see what the follow-up is um, afterwards and whether people are gonna be grandstanding and pushing um, and, and trying to negotiate to get things out of rules or if they're content with having introduced it and got, getting a press pop. Um, oh, I, I guess I should also say, I think another factor in that question of independence will be the state's attorney's race. And I think if um, Anita Alvarez ends up losing the state's attorney's race, that'll be an, kind of another thing in that, in that list of, of things that might shift the dynamics a little bit. Um, I got asked as well about money and politics. And um, I think I, I started out saying that I have one one client, I am employed by AFSCME. So that creates a different dynamic than if I was a uh, contract lobbyist who, contract lobbyist, as I see it, I've never been a contract lobbyist, but from my perspective, as a contract lobbyist, you have multiple clients, they, your primary focus is the, the relationships at all costs. Like no one's gonna hire you if you don't have relationships with seemingly powerful people. Um, for me, my primary focus is my members and making sure that whatever it is, I advance what's best for my members and having one client kind of allows me to, uh, you know, make that the primary focus, the issue the primary focus. And not to say nobody wants to blow off any relationships, but um, if there's someone my union's going after, then it, I don't really have to, pretends <laughs> um, I'm associated with the union. I am Adrian from, from AFSCME, period. Like there's no other, uh, that is my identity to people who know me in politics. Um, so for us, the way we determine who gets money or who doesn't, uh, and I'm pretty proud of this because it makes my life easier. I get to have the moral high ground. We have a rubric. Um, so every time that I ask people for their vote on something, to sign on to a letter, to show up at a press conference. It goes into my Excel sheet and everyone is asked, everyone gets a yes or a no. They all get a grade essentially. And if you're at a certain level, then you get money and there's like three bands and it's equal that way. So they're, you know, uh, politicians, because they don't often know that we have a rubric, I get a lot of accusations, especially when I first started, um, particularly in Springfield, there's a lot of accusations like, oh, well, the unions give more money to white people or the unions give more money to Chicago people. Um, and it's easy to say, no, look, we have this rubric. Everyone who falls into this gets this. That's how it's done. This person got more money because they had a better score. You didn't because you voted wrong on half of our stuff. So, so it makes it easy to do. That's how we do it. Everybody, of course, doesn't do it that way. Um, I couldn't talk about how other folks uh, do their contributions. Um, there's the question of lobbyists and taking folks out to eat. If Derek had pulled me up, you would have seen that I didn't spend any money on taking people out. I prefer not to. That's just a personal preference. Um, I, I mean, especially I think it's more the case in Springfield where you're in, you're out of town, people are going to dinners a lot. That's more prevalent there, although I know contract lobbyists do a lot more here. That's also reflected on the, on the, on the site. Um, but for me, it's like, there's no point in buying someone lunch at City Hall when we, we, we can sit in your office and talk, there's no need. Um, and for me, I think kind of the stuff that AFSCME is asking in particular, it's mostly budget focused um, and kind of hard ask. You know, we want you to step out in a press conference and say the mayor's holding on to our, um, our privatization bill and it should get out of rules. That's a harder ask that buying a dinner isn't gonna get you. <laughs> so. So why, I mean, and, and our money that we give from our PAC is members, out of members' paychecks. Um, so it makes me feel 
more responsible, like I need to be responsible with it. I would hate to like be like given dinner here, dinner here. And, uh, you know, then the next day people are voting against us on all the big issues because they were happy to go to dinner for free, but not willing to step out on a vote. Because our members look at that stuff too. I mean, it's all available. And, and so we get dinged all the time. You guys just gave this person $5,000 and then they did that as if it should translate, but it doesn't. <laughs> so so uh, it's easier for me. Um, I mean, sometimes we do like, we take the Black Caucus out for dinner in Springfield to discuss some issue. And it's rarely on my card, just out of principle. <laughs> Um, and then Steve asked me a question about data um, and what data would be helpful to me for, for the job. And I had to confess this was actually the hardest question I got because I do use, um, like I use the city's open data portal um, a, a lot and I've looked on the lobbyist at, uh, site when it came out. And I, like, I feel like I pay attention to the open data stuff that's coming out. But uh, the stuff that's most helpful is like the hardest to get. Like we've been asking the Department of Public Health about numbers on mental health um, clinics and like where did people go after the clinics closed. And that's, you know, we can get something and then it's like, well, is this the best, is this the most accurate? or is there other data that's out there? And that's kind of like the data stuff that I'm thinking about um, most often in my job is like, what's the accuracy of this data? And I'm looking forward to, I'm glad that the city now has a independent budget office to kind of look at uh, some of the budget data and the information that comes out. But I don't, I don't really have a good answer to your question, Steve. I'm, I'm always excited to see what people are doing with the data, particularly at the city that comes out. I think the mapping um, stuff that WBZ did around like 911 phone calls and mental health and stuff like that that comes out occasionally uh, is really good, uh, particularly because I think a lot of the aldermen um, just may not know how different city policies are, uh, impact their own ward until other people share that information with them. Um, but yeah, there's not one data set that I've been looking for that doesn't exist. So with that, I'll open up. There's a question. So where exactly does the money go? It, when, when you guys give it to the politician, does it go to like their campaign fund or you know, how does that work? And then uh, the, the second piece, what are the other inputs that politicians are taking in to make decisions other than just from the, the lobbyists. Yeah. Okay, so the first question, where does the money go? We, we cut checks to their campaign funds. Um, and sometimes it's very specific ask, um, you know, leading up to during elections, it's, that's when we give our biggest checks and it, usually it's because we know very specifically um, what they're gonna spend it on. I mean, in the, in the same way that I don't like spending on their meals in a macro way. Uh, the union would like to know when we give someone a $5,000 check. It's not just, I, I mean, some of them maybe use their, our money to do passing, which I think is like, I'm not from Chicago, so we didn't do like poll passing. It's, it's like a waste of money to me. But oh, the, when you go vote, sometimes there's people standing out that have a card that says punch whatever in their name like as if you didn't know who you were going to vote for when you arrived, but it's the throwback from the machine days when, you know, that person, you know, your precinct person was giving you the list of who to vote for. But I think it's a little less effective now. Um, but but um, usually we, we wanna know what our money is going towards and we wanna know it's an effective means of spending the money, but it's campaign funds. Um, and then, uh, the second question around what other inputs, um, a lot of times I think it's random constituents that may weigh in on something and, and that's seriously the most effective. I mean, I think for me, 
as a lobbyist um, who has who represents like people members that live in their districts uh, if, it, if there's a serious bill that I'm working then I'm doing my job best when I have a member that lives in their ward that comes with me to talk about. I talk about the big picture issue, why it's important for the union. They talk about how they're impacted by it. And they say, you know, and I live in your ward. That's because they would rather not tell someone who's voting for them or not uh, that they don't want to do what they're going to do. Um, Alex, you want to add? Oh, or you want to ask a question? Yeah. Not all in a different style. Yeah. Well, and and on that, um, I would say that's why we are really useful during AFSME is really useful during budget time. Um, I mean, a lot of what I do is analyzing. I, I look for every single member in our bu in the budget to make sure they're still there. And if they're not, then I'm I'm talking to them about what it is that that budget line that they're cutting like what the tangible impact is because when the aldermen get the budget book um, and they have their, their uh, daily department meetings, they may have some questions just based on the numbers, but the, the commissioner's not gonna go through every line of the budget. So a lot of the times what I'll do is I'll say, there's an increase in the contract line here. Can you ask a question about that? or this program is being cut, so can you tell, ask them to justify what it is that they're doing about that program? So I'll pass out questions to the aldermen just to help, help them understand what the impact is. Would you have a question? Um, so I'm asking Adrian to tell us her crazy story. Now, you don't have to tell names, um, but what's the most insane thing you've seen um, and why a bill didn't pass? Oh, why a bill didn't pass. Uh, well, I'll tell you, uh, just the period craziest thing is um, uh, I had someone who I asked uh, about voting on something, and they came, they, they signed on and then came and told me, okay, I signed on to your bill, I'm going to need your help, I'm running for, you know, office and I need your financial support in City Hall, like, not okay <laughs> on multiple levels, but it's um, given the history and even there's been indictments since I've been around, like you should know there's, I mean, there's ways to ask me for money and it's completely legal, but perhaps doing it at City Hall right after you signed on to the bill and saying that that's why you signed on to my bill is not a good idea. Yeah. Did uh, you face a lot of opposition or opposition to money in particular when you were working on passing the PTAO? Um, n no, not really. I, I mean, I think, and can everybody hear the question? The, the question was, was there opposition money or opposition, uh, organized opposition when we were trying to pass the privatization ordinance? Um, they, the problem with, I think, most city council bills, there's not a lot that are contentious in like the sense of there's two warring factions and like that not so much, um, or at least not as much as Springfield. Um, but oftentimes it's just that people put out ideas and then nothing happens. Um, so the fight for us was to keep it relevant on people's minds um, and keep people from thinking that it was dead. Um, and, and so that was the biggest thing. And the reason was because there was no movement and um, the administration wanted to wait for the right time or, you know, I mean, and I think they wanted to see if it, if it would just go away. Um, there was a lot of discussion during the negotiations about what was feasible to expect um, and you know we had a kind of low threshold when we first started um, and there was questions about whether that was a good thing whether we should you know 
construction projects would fall under that and whether there should be a different threshold for them or whether they should be exempted. So there was a, a lot of back and forth about things once we got to the table, but it was keeping it relevant and keeping people from thinking, oh, that's, that's not happening. Um, that, that was the big problem. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff that gets introduced in city council. Some of it good, some of it random, um, but a lot of stuff just ends up in rules or even gets sent to a committee and just doesn't ever get heard. There's a lot of stuff that gets, is just sitting in committee. Um, so, so that's the big problem. Some of it personally, um, some people just introduce legislation, may be a good idea, but may not really work it. And um, so you have five people that sit closest to you sign a bill and it gets assigned to a committee, but it's not getting heard. Then people aren't trying to get more co sponsors or doing press or a lot of the legwork that it takes to actually get the thing passed. So that's why a lot of things stay fallow too. It's not necessarily a malicious thing, but just since it didn't automatically go through the process, it's not, it's not being debated. Yeah. Do you think that um, the city council members might be receptive to something from us that, that helps them kind of sift through information or something that they would either be a resource that they could use or that they could like post or have um, post for their constituents or something? Absolutely. Um, I, so I think one pagers are God. <laughs> um, like, like that's, that's the only way you're going to get people to like even really start to look at what you're talking about. Um, I'd say sit down and have a few targeted meetings with people that might be interested in whatever it is that you're working on. Um, either based off of who your alderman is or if they've expressed interest in an issue before um, so that you have like a champion, uh, someone that can advocate for you, that can be a resource for other aldermen to talk to them about it. Um, or even to say, hey, um, I talked to Alderman X, their work, I, I worked with them to help them understand why data is important. And now they have a link to this open source whatever on their site. You can go look and and just having an example of it's been done, somebody else did it before, it's not the revolution. Like, we'll just help that, uh, get that process started. Um, and if there's something specific, we can talk afterwards and I can maybe tell you like, oh, I think this alderman would be willing to do that. Yep. Yes, I do think the aldermen could do stuff. Um, I, I mean, so I worked for a city council person in Atlanta when I was in college. Um, and then I, I lived in um, Minnesota during grad school. So like the city council experiences I had before are a little different, but, um, and I think there's not so much of a culture of doing it here but I do think it's possible. Um, I just think that it's helpful. It depends on who you are going to, and I would say choose your sponsor carefully. Um, and that's, you know, even in Springfield where there's more of a culture of doing that. Um, choose your sponsor carefully. Be very clear of what your expectations are. Have a plan so you can help guide them uh, have grassroots support um, so that it's more than just one person um, coming to and talking to them about it. Make sure they're hearing about it from different places. Find out who it is they listen to. I'd say probably in each ward, there's one organization that an alderman really cares about. Like, and it may, there may be more than one, but there's at least one organization that an alderman really cares about. So if that organization is making something an issue or it relates to that organization would be beneficial to that organization, then that's helpful. 
Uh, it's just a matter of, I think, getting a couple of things in place. I mean, it's always easier if you're willing to do a lot of the legwork and the alderman can just get plugged in <laughs> into the process. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's impossible. And I, I say that even only having done one, <laughs> one bill basically um, in the time that uh, I I've been lobbying city council for over five years now. But I just think it, it, it also depends on the issue because every issue you're gonna come up against isn't, isn't the administration's not gonna be opposed to it. And the administration could see that this alderman is proposing an issue and say, I'd like to be a part of that. And then that makes your pathway that much easier. So it just depends on what it is, but I think it's absolutely possible. Yeah. Why do so few things get pulled out of committees when they've been sitting in there for months? When there's a, by the rules of the council, there's a procedure to pull them out. There is a procedure. And so we looked at this and then the Progressive Caucus a couple of years ago tried to use said procedure. Technically, in the rules of the council, which are actually really short, it's like two pages of rules, um, after 60 days, something's supposed to move out of committee. Um, there's no enforcement mechanism in the city council rules. Um, the option is Rule 41, um, which, to my knowledge, hasn't been successful, uh, at least in the time that I've been here. It's never been successful. Um, so a couple of years ago on the TIF ordinance, a, a TIF ordinance, there's m many variations, and then the elected school board um, ordinance, uh, a progressive caucus tried to do rule 41 um, to get those things uh, moved from committee. And it uh, did not work. Um, it failed fairly badly. Uh, I think elected school board might have gotten 12 votes, somewhere around there. Um, so that was, there was a conversation with one gung-ho person who's no longer in council who wanted to do the same thing with the privatization ordinance because, you know, they felt like um, it was, um, you know, it was a perfect issue to call the mayor out on privatization and let's have these people put on the record that, that they're against privatization. Well, um, it, it's never happened, and it, is, it really does become about, in that sense, are you with this constituency group or are you with the mayor? Um, and the votes aren't there for it. <laughs> um, and then your ordinance or issue is effectively dead. So that's why people don't use it. Do you go to every city council meeting? I am at every city council meeting that doesn't conflict with Springfield. So next week, I won't be there. I'll be in Springfield. Um, if there's something big we're pushing, then I can choose to stay back for city council. But it's just been so hectic with the state that the state has trumped city council for for maybe the last year or so. And do you testify? I testify on every budget hearing, the public hearing that they have at City Hall, um, which is, it's, it's always fun. Someone's from the mayor's office is here, so maybe they have some insight on who gets to go first or not. But, but it doesn't matter when you, when you sign in. Lawrence Massal from the Civic Federation is always first uh, and talks really long time. And then a lot of the aldermen leave. One year I got to be, one year I was third and I was like, yes. <laughs> you know? um, and then, so that was the year before last. And then this year I was second to last again. And I was like, damn it. <laughs> like, what, what did we do? But we were fighting on the, uh, th uh, the 311 privatization. So um, usually when I testify, there's only a few aldermen there. So, um, but, but yes, I do it every year. And um, most of the time, in, like I testified on the privatization ordinance when it came up in committee, 
Um, usually we try and have um, members testify to like very specific issues and I usually testify if it's like a broad overview type thing where the, the budget we have you know a bunch of members that are impacted but maybe we had uh, this year we also had taxi drivers who were organizing testify on some of those provisions to talk specifically about the impact on them but I gave a broad kind of sense of what was going on. I uh, don't like to speak in public actually and um, I, I prefer just like talking to the alderman uh, and I don't do press if I don't have to. Um, we have a press person for that and it's always better I think and more effective to have the members uh, speak and tell because they can tell things so much better than I can. I mean I can say during the health clinic closure fight, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of Ms. Lula who worked here since she was 19 and is now in her 60s and this is why she cares so much about the clinic, but it's way better if Ms. Lula goes herself. So. Yeah, it's hard. There's no easy answer to that question. Um, honestly, I think one thing that's helped me kind of figure that out is um, one, of the, one of the advantages I have is doing city, county, and um, state because I kind of see who's playing in all the spaces. Uh, so I'm mean, just going to pick on Logan Square. Um, uh, Logan Square Neighborhood Association is everywhere, everywhere. I mean, they're doing a lot of grassroots stuff. They're working on schools issues. They're down in Springfield talking about grow your own teacher. Like they're everywhere. And I never lived in Logan Square, but I see them everywhere and I know how active they are. And I know that uh, aldermen are paying attention to what they're doing. And I know that if they get involved on the campaign side, and even though they're, they're not technically involved on the campaign side, but the moms who are working with Logan Square organization, uh, neighborhood association, are a powerful voice in that community and advocates in that community. So it's from being around and seeing, seeing them show up. Um, I think also um, it's mis making missteps. So I used to live in 25 um, and went somewhere and I said to <laughs> Alderman Solis, like, oh, Pilsen Alliance is signed on. He was like, oh, my favorites, you know, like, and then, and then only to find out, you know, one of their staffers ran against them the next time. I mean, they have a pretty contentious or, uh, you know, relationship, which I found out because I was like, oh yeah, we got a Pilsen organization on, signed on. Um, so there's really, there's really no easy uh, answer to it. Um, I think, it's also like if you're in the neighborhood um, and you're, you, you see where your alderman shows up, um, not every alderman, I mean, some aldermen are incredibly open, have ward nights, are actually like spending time talking to people at their ward nights as opposed to like taking down uh, notes on, you know, trash, alley, whatever. Um, some of them are like, you know, this is my one night, we're like getting everybody through, so you don't, if ward night is your only option to meet with them, fine, but make a meeting. Uh, don't, don't let them push you to ward night. <laughs> um, I, it, it just depends, like some of them, some of the aldermanic staff is set up in a way that they have a policy person on staff, and that person might be able to help you navigate, like, are there any important constituencies that I need to be reaching out to? Are, are there any folks that the alderman would like me to have on board? And they'll tell you. Um, a lot of aldermen don't have policy people, so that's a little harder. There's no, there's no easy answer. A lot of, it varies tremendously by alderman. All right. Thank you guys. Awesome. Thank you.